Whether we're aware of it or not, our cultural background impacts the way we see and understand the world. And nowhere is this fact more clearly on display than when we compare the visual arts of various cultures around the globe. Today, we're going to do some of that comparative work. We'll start by asking, what is art anyway? And then we'll see how, in the 20th century, new perspectives emerged to challenge the outmoded assessments of non-Western art. Once we've done that, uh, we'll move to the work of visual anthropology and the history of ethnographic films like Nanook of the North uh, to see how video technologies can both support and complicate our anthropological mission to document world cultures. So let's start with the big question. What exactly is art? Now, to get at this question, I show various images to my students and I ask them to rate particular works of art on my handy dandy artometer, right? Uh, basically, they take in an image and then they score it on a scale of one to five with five being the gold standard, pure art. For example, the majority, they always rate Van Gogh's The Starry Night a perfect five out of five on that art meter. Now, then when I show them another classic like Gustave Carbet's The Artist's Studio, most students appreciate his sharp technical precision as a painter, but there are always some students who give Courbet slightly less than five out of five, because to them, it's not quite as arty as Van Gogh. They typically explain that Courbet's sharp realism, to them, it's basically a straightforward objective photograph. They, they rate him lower because they're missing the vibrant and imaginative twist that they see in Van Gogh's Starry Night. Ultimately, my students do agree that some works are definitely art, just not as pure, not five out of five art. Andy Warhol's soup cans, they fall into this less than pure category of art. Uh, same thing goes when I show them tourist art from West Africa, like a miniature bicycle sculpted out of wire and old pesticide cans. But to wrap up the exercise, I dropped the big one, a half completed paint by numbers picture of like a snowy barn or a sailboat. And without fail, this painting, it gets the lowest ratings of all. Some of my students simply can't imagine giving anything but a zero to a paint by numbers painting. At any rate, one of the lessons that usually comes out of the artometer exercise is that there's really not a clear line distinguishing art from non-art. You know, for those who penalize paint by numbers art, for them, Art has a critical technical skills threshold that just has to be met. And if you have to paint by numbers, this group would say, you just don't have the technical chops to rank amongst the greats. But then, the folks who downgraded Courbet's realism because it was too representational, too much like a photograph, well, for them, art has a definitive creativity threshold. So Courbet, he may have the technical chops, but somehow, the way he sees the world, is less imaginative, less creative than the way other artists do. At least, that's what some critics would argue. So, the truth is, there just isn't a single definition of art. For some, it's about technical prowess, while for others, it's all about imagination. And then, there are still different people who they might focus on message or level of abstraction, but the definition of art, ultimately, is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. So the question, what is art? It's only grown thornier as anthropologists have expanded our cultural horizons, particularly over the 20th century, as we've learned more and more about cultural diversity. Western anthropologists and art historians, they've grappled with the way they should categorize non-Western art. And walking down the grand marble floors in our art museums, we Westerners, we've long felt at home with the familiar schools like the Greco-Roman wing, the Renaissance collection, the neoclassical rooms, the Impressionists. But what about non-Western art? Well, when anthropologists and others first examined the art of the ancient Aztecs, or even the art of Africa more generally, they labeled it primitive art. But is this a helpful way to look at non-Western art? I mean, just consider the Chihuahua sculpture that is a unifying symbol amongst the Bamana people of West Africa. Now, the Chihuahua, it depicts an antelope 
which is a, which it's carved out of wood and it features intricate details in the horns, face, body, and even in its mane. And I've seen brilliant Chihuahua pieces that were made less than a decade ago by sculptors who live in Bamako, the capital city of Mali. Now, these artists, they're modern, not primitive, and so are their sculptures. But there was a time when anthropology identified African art and the Chihuahua as primitive, whether or not it was produced 500 years ago or just yesterday morning. Primitive. As we've seen in other lectures, this problematic way of categorizing other cultures can be traced to the Industrial Revolution when Westerners began to view progress as the dominant narrative of our humanity, our ultimate purpose. And that's when anthropology first got its footing as an academic discipline. So really, it's not surprising that early anthropologists like Edward Burnett Tyler incorporated this progress narrative into their work. People like Tyler, they viewed Africans as primitive humans, so that's how they characterized African art and cultures as well. Actually, art itself wasn't really a major specialization in the early years of anthropology. In fact, when it came to art, early anthropology, it was a split house. Now, on the one hand, we had the archaeologists who unearth and interpret art from all across the world. And in these early days, they examined artistic artifacts by studying their form and meaning. Then, on the other hand, sociocultural anthropologists, at least, again, in those early days, they tended to shy away from studying form. They were really just looking more at the functional dimensions of art objects. But things changed around the middle of the 20th century when new generations of anthropologists staked new territory on the interpretivist or symbolic side of our discipline. You see, rather than testing and correcting theories built on materialist, empirical data, these anthropologists, they embraced the immeasurable interpretive dimensions of the human experience. And that included an appreciation for different modes of artistic expression. So, with an eye for interpretation, symbolic anthropologists like Claude Levi-Strauss and Victor Turner, they embraced artistic expressions as treasure troves of cultural insight and data. In his classic book, The Savage Mind, Levi Strauss described artists as hybrid creatures that are one part scientist and one part craftsman, or what he calls a bricoleur. Now, the craftsman builds a material object, say, a chihuahua sculpture, but that object, he says, is an object of knowledge. It contains an entire world view, or as the famous Russian painter Vasily Kandinsky called it, a whole lifetime of fears, doubts, hopes, and joy. And in an ever more connected world, people in the 20th century were more exposed to non-Western art and cultures than those who lived just a few decades before. And this art, it captured the imagination of the West, which was decades away from YouTube and Google. People, they looked into African masks to, to look into Africa and Africans themselves. And in the art world, primitive art eventually emerged as an exciting trend when visionary artists like Pablo Picasso, for example, developed his Cubist perspective in large part through his appreciation and emulation of African masks and sculptures. You see, if you look at African masks, for example, you can plainly see ears, eyes, and maybe even a mouth. You can tell that it represents a person or perhaps an antelope. But it isn't like any person or antelope that you've ever seen. You know, from the elongated noses, the sharp geometric points for ears, and for the Chihuahua antelope, the, the, the head is bigger than the entire body. And then, if you look at that same exact mask from the side, or maybe in a different light, it transforms. It looks completely different than it did. It's almost as if the carver created that mask using more than one set of eyes more than a singular point of view, plural vision, if you will. Well, that's essentially the inspiration for Picasso's cubism. All those strange shapes and forms, are, they're multiple perspectives visualized at once. Uh, Duchamp's new descending a staircase, that's another great example. In it, we see a figure descending down a set of stairs, but 
In one glance, we see that figure at all moments of her descent, from start to finish, and simultaneously. Now, we'll leave the official definition of cubism for art historians, but from our anthropological approach, we can appreciate connections between the emergence of cubism and the rise of primitive art in the West. And once more, we need to ask, given that connection, given the influence of so-called primitive forms on Western art, is primitive really the word we should be using? Well, that question got answered in the late 20th century when primitive art as a museum-approved genre uh, came of age, and then shortly after, promptly went extinct. Um, the extinction of the term primitive art, it occurred as anthropologists continued to expand the ways we were looking at art. Adding to the symbolic and interpretivist work of the mid-century, new research themes emerged to look at the sociocultural context of art, the politics of representation, and even the repatriation of art to places like Mali, Egypt, and Greece. Sociologist Howard Becker, he was a leading figure in this movement to understand art as a sociocultural process, not just as objects produced by artists. And in one of his most celebrated texts, Art Worlds, he reframes art as a cooperative network of everyone who participates in the production of it. Now, there's the artist, of course, but there's also the people who make and sell art supplies. There's the dealers, there's critics, there's consumers, installation experts, business managers, and the list goes on. But with social Darwinism subsumed by cultural relativity, Anthropologists, they found it no longer tenable to classify non-Western art as primitive. The Chihuahua sculpture isn't more primitive than the Mona Lisa, it's just from a different world. And as such, the idea of primitive art fell out of favor, and in its place, anthropologists and others now use geographic categories to describe what we once called primitive. So at the Met in New York, for example, the Rockefeller Wing now houses a collection called The Arts of Africa, Oceania, and the Americas. I mean, it has thousands of artifacts dating from 3000 BCE right through to the present. See, art is culturally, temporally, and geographically bound, but it's not primitive. And that's a major change since the origins of anthropology and the study of non-Western art. Through cultural relativity and symbolic and interpretivist methods, anthropologists discovered new ways to think about the human condition. Specifically, they created visual anthropology, an inclusive specialization that examines humanity by studying performance, media, and media technologies. Basically, they'll look at any visual representations from art to urban murals and just so much more. Perhaps the, the most well-known aspect of visual anthropology at least for the general public, is ethnographic photography and film, doing anthropology with cameras, right? So as I promised at the outset, I'm going to pivot now from looking at the broader world of the visual arts to looking specifically at the visual work of anthropologists themselves. Since the early days of anthropology, researchers have used still and moving images to document and analyze culture. And in the evolution of ethnographic film, aided by remarkable developments in sound and camera technology, inspired anthropologists to incorporate progressively more and more of the emic perspectives of their research populations. You see, they were bringing a core lesson from early anthropologists like Bronislaw Malinowski, who trained his students to record ethnographic utterances, to record the words and the thoughts of your study community using, at least at first, their own exact words. Now, many saw additional advantages to the camera. I mean, even a grainy early film of a Zuni harvest festival dance would be far superior to a written account recorded by a visitor, right? I mean, after all, unlike other ways of recording culture, film captures body language and the environment surrounding whatever it is that's being filmed, whether that's a ritual, a performance, or really any aspect of daily life for that matter. Now, these are details we don't get from interviews, surveys, and other anthropological methods. 
there's something special about getting data on film. Well, maybe. I mean, sure, film can be an important tool in our anthropological kit, but let me add just uh, one caveat. People often work on the assumption that a picture, whether it's still or moving, provides purely objective information. With a video camera, we can not only interview our research subjects, but we can record their actual responses, right down to their posture and the pitch of their voice, right? I mean, we get those voices and images directly from the study community. Pure, unadulterated data, right? Wrong. Yeah, there was a time when we thought that cameras don't lie, but in a Photoshop world, now we know much better. Take some of my Malian photography. I mean, I love taking photos of children. But, you know, those photos, uh, they don't provide an unfiltered perspective. Let me explain. So, I'll be walking around doing something in the village when I turn the corner and come across an endearing scene of a young mother bathing a child in a bright pink plastic tub. You know, they're laughing and splashing, and with the big mango tree over there and a goat right behind them, the picture's perfect. So, I do what I'm supposed to. I greet them both, and, and I ask, may I please take your picture? Sure, they say, but, and this happens every single time. The mother, she goes running off into her hut, she changes into one of her best outfits, and then she wraps a beautiful scarf around her head. I mean, my ideal representation of the daily beauty and pace of my host community, this mother bathing her child in a, well, shirt and a skirt I always see her in, well, that isn't the representation she wants me to put on film. If we were simply chatting or maybe even recording our voices, the moment would have proceeded without that urgent costume change. But, kind of like working at home in your pajamas, when it's time to Skype your boss, you better at least change your shirt and check your hair. We all do this. The last time I was filmed teaching, for example, I put on a coat and tie. I mean, my students, they almost didn't recognize me, but the cameras were coming, I told them. I had to sharpen up. So that video shows real students in a real class, and it was the real lecture too, but I modified my performance and my appearance in a way that I wouldn't have on any other day. You see, that camera's presence, it changed my entire approach. We call that cinestance. The second a camera emerges, bang, cinestance. We act different than we would otherwise. Like, as if the whole world was watching, we tend to tighten things up for that camera. And as you can imagine, that's a challenge to visual anthropology. I mean, if we're using cameras to observe and record the way people live and think in their day-to-day -day lives, won't bringing a camera ruin everything? I mean, won't cinestance just kick right in, giving us an altered reality? Perhaps one with nicer than normal clothes, for example? Well, now that we've had our caveat about the assumed objectivity of film, let's close by examining how anthropologists have learned to deal with cinestance. We're going to review a few pivotal anthropology film classics that document the development of ethnographic film as a genre. And we'll see how anth our anthropological quest to accurately portray our research communities, it inspired more participatory and transparent approaches that eventually have us stepping in front of the lens and sometimes even handing over our cameras. Our brief ethnographic film festival begins with Nenik of the North. This 1922 film is the first major anthropology film and it actually helped pioneer the documentary film genre. The filmmaker, Robert Flaherty, filmed episodes from the daily lives of Arctic people and audiences, they loved this rare and close-up glance into Inuit life. Modern critics, however, they've critiqued Flaherty for leaving out all signs of modernity focusing his lens only on the activities and scenes that emphasize the pre-modern living conditions of the Inuit. Now, despite the presence of his equipment, not to mention the modern conveniences to be found at the local trading post, Flaherty, he chose to show only scenes that portrayed an illusion, an illusion of the pristine and so-called primitive state of Inuit people living off the frigid land. Now, 
This was well before the era of documentary film, so it's not surprising that Flaherty violated a few of the cardinal rules that would later define the genre. For example, the scenes and people he shares with the audience, they're not as authentic as you might expect. You see, he actually casted this film. The main star, Nanook, he is indeed a hunter, and we do see him harpooning a real seal, wrestling with a walrus, and even building remarkable igloos, including a small one just for his puppies. But his loving wives and adorable children, they weren't his own. Flaherty, he staged the family and their activities in order to capture Inuit life. But he exaggerated the remoteness and the pre-modern qualities of those daily lives. Now, Flaherty, he was open about this, and his stage scenes, they still mesmerized audiences nonetheless. So, seated in their velvety theater seats, uh, his audience snacked on popcorn as Nanook and his family delivered an enthralling and a visually stunning peek into the stark way of life that they could hardly imagine. So, Nanook of the North remains a classic, despite the fact that it's anything but cinema verite. And it seems that Flaherty avoided the cinestance problem by just recruiting actors to film scenes of daily activities and family life in an igloo. And while it may be disappointing to learn that that rainbow, um, that beautiful four-month-old baby, isn't really Nanook's child, one still gets the feeling that we're seeing something genuine on that screen. I mean, there's a magical moment in the film where Nanook's children, they tumble with puppies on a soft, furry animal skin, and even knowing that that was a stage scene, the images, they just feel authentic. The tender parenting and the arduous physicality of daily life they combine in a way that the viewer recognizes a common humanity in people that early anthropologists first classified as primitive. Flaherty's approach to visually recording and presenting Inuit life, well, it inspired countless documentary filmmakers, and among them were dozens and dozens of anthropologists. One of my former teachers, Napoleon Shagnon, and his film partner, Timothy Ash, they left a camera on during a rather violent fight they witnessed among a band of South American forest dwellers. Now, they edited that footage into an anthropological film titled The Axe Fight, which is now shown in hundreds of anthropology classes every year. Unlike Flaherty, Shagnon and Ash, they didn't stage an axe fight with local actors. Instead, the camera just sits there, drawn on a confusing scene accompanied by some terribly discomforting wails. You see, it was 1971, and Shagnon and Ash, they had just arrived in their Amazonian host village. And to their surprise, a fight broke out right before their eyes. Now, we learned that an enduring tension in the community, well, it boiled over when visitors from a neighboring community asked to be fed despite their refusal to help out in their host's gardens. Then. One of the visitors, a man, he actually beats a woman who has refused to give him food from her garden. Now, distraught, she screams and is then comforted by her family while her brother and husband settle this dispute, first with clubs and then with axes and machetes. But it's not as gory as it may sound. Um, only one man is hurt, and there isn't much fighting because people intervene, placing themselves between these two groups. The gravity of the episode neutralized the cinestance factor, but the filmmakers did something else to deliver an authentic representation of this axe fight. Shagnon and Ash, they captured about 10 minutes of this half-hour episode, and for their final film, they show the footage four times in a row. First, they show an unedited version with sound. Now, you can hear some comments by the filmmakers as they were filming, but there's no narration or explanation, really, of what we're seeing, okay? Then there's the second version, and in that second version, Shagnon's voice explains what's happening, including his own original confusion about what was going on. Then in that third version, the filmmakers, they diagram the lineages and families involved in the fight, and this presentation makes it clear that we're witnessing one episode of a long, enduring conflict. Then, last, Shagnon and Ash, they present an edited version of the fight, which transparently 
illustrates how the filmmaker's own cultural point of view is at work when we're making ethnographic films. In a sense, they're showing their work. They give you the raw material, they then share some background context, and then they show an edited version that flows as a film while presenting credible scholarship in a visual form. Their approach recognized that ethnographic filmmakers reveal culture at work on both sides of the lens, and they dealt with that challenge through transparency. From raw footage and confusion to an edited episode that finally makes sense, Shagnon and Ash bring the viewer into their process before sharing the final version of what really went down. Now, ethnographic filmmaker Jean Ruche took the Shagnon and Ash approach to a whole new level. Flaherty, remember, carefully kept his lens away from any hint of modernity, including his own equipment and supplies. I mean, we get so enticed by this remote and foreign world that we forget there was a camera and filmmaker directing each and every one of those shots. Now, Rouge, he did something amazing, right? He did amazing ethnographic film projects with the Dogon Cliff Dwellers in Northern Mali. And he never let you forget we're seeing a constructed scene. Specifically, he himself steps into the lens with his subjects, and he even shows film and audio equipment in his shots. You know, it's like on Saturday Night Live. Sometimes the boom mic, right, it, it kind of messes up the frame, and we see that thing poke right into the top of the frame. Well, Jean Rouche, he wanted that mic scene. For the viewer and the participant, Rouche felt that we can't avoid cinestance. So, if you can't beat it, Join it, accept it, make it part of the story. His approach was a logical first step to what we now call participatory video and photography. Participatory visual approaches are now quite common in anthropology today. These ethnographic encounters, they place photography and video equipment into the hands of research populations themselves, who then visually reveal their attitudes and worldview with images instead of words. I did this once with my Malian friends. I gave them cameras to document our visit to an agricultural research station. And seeing the station through their eyes helped me see what mattered to them. They took pictures of some interesting types of sorghum that they had never seen before. Um, there were a few pictures in the lab and of people, but these farmers showed me that when it comes to the agricultural research station, it was the sorghum trials that most interested them. In this lecture, We've seen how evolution-inspired ideas of cultural progress initially seeped into the anthropological view of so-called primitive art. And this is consistent with what we've seen in other lectures, from religion to family structure to human sexuality and even artistic expression, or just about any other facet of human diversity. Anthropology was initially rooted in social Darwinism. We saw non-Western people as primitive, as a sharp binary opposite to the modernity of the West. But because our discipline is a scientific one, we've always tested and corrected what we learn and think. And today, we've once more discovered that social Darwinism is refuted by empirical data. This correction has had an impact even upon the way that we collect and interpret information on film as the lens through which anthropologists view cultural diversity has changed with the times. And that change, that adjustment of our lens, has brought the common elements of the human condition more sharply into focus.